<clears throat> right then, uh, brethren, last week, if you were with us, we were talking about uh, preparing for, for harvest time, talking about you and I are on a course heading towards an ultimate harvest, either individually or as the people of God together. And one of the key things about a harvest is a harvest takes time. You know, you don't plant seed in the morning and boom, two or three hours later you have a harvest. Doesn't doesn't normally work that way. A harvest takes time from the seed, you know, through the, the process up towards um, the full head in the air, then maturity, fruitfulness, and then you have a harvest. So we were saying last week, one of the takeaways, I guess, thinking about ourselves being on this course towards a harvest, either your personal individual harvest or, like I say, the people of God at the end of the age, it is uh, for, you know, I should be aware of the passage of time and make sure we were not entirely wasting that time, right? We should use our days wisely, not going hell for leather every second, of course, but by and large, as the years progress, we could ask ourselves, am I growing? <clears throat> am I developing? Am I more mature, more Christ-like now than I was 10 years ago or 50 years ago, whatever, right? And when you're looking at, at time and the passage of time, there's a psalm that crops up, which is uh, sometimes not so much misquoted, but it is misapplied, or at least a portion of the psalm is misapplied because people generally, even outside of churches, as a well-known passage, often refer to it as limiting human beings like you and me to three score years and ten, which if you're a young person, you know what a score is, three score years and ten <laughs> is 70 years, all right? Um, which is a fair amount of time, okay? But the question would be, is that what God said? Did God say that, that you and I, human beings, would be limited to three score years and ten? And I've, what I've heard, even ministers have said things like, uh, that being the case, brethren, you need to start putting your house in order as you get towards your three score years and ten. All right? Don't leave it too late. And I heard one minister say, uh, of course, and he was just turned 70 and he said, I'm, I'm now in borrowed time. I've reached my three score years and ten. I'm now on borrowed time. So, you know, the impression you get really is that, well, if, if, if that's it, if God's word says that uh, we're in borrowed time and three score years and ten is it, um, wow, right? Now, of course, there's a problem. <laughs> Fairly obvious problem because, for example, Many of us already passed three score years and ten, correct? I'm past three score years and ten. I know some of you are. I know some of you aren't, of course. Um, and actually, if you look around the world, huge numbers of people lived, live more than three score years and ten. We have a, a chart we're going to put up. I'm not sure you'll be able to read every part of it, but I'll hit the highlights. This is from Wikipedia, and it highlights there... 35 countries in the world where people live longer than 80, right? They live longer than four score years. 35 countries here. Japan is about 84 on average. That's the average. Some live much longer than that. Uh, Australia, I think, is about 83. Um, I think Canada is about 82, as is Austria. The UK is about 81, right? And you get many more countries there. Right. Where's the USA? If you're looking for the USA, it's not there. <laughs> the USA isn't in the top 50. Intriguing, bearing in mind it's the most medicated country in the world. Doesn't even make the top 50. But the point I'm making is that there are many, many countries, 35 countries on that list alone, where people on average live longer than 80, which of course is a lot longer than three score years and 10. All right. I mean, here in this country, uh, queen Elizabeth, our queen, uh, is 96. Her mother died a few years ago at the age of 102. Right, So there are people who live much longer than three score years and ten. We have, a, I think, a photograph coming up. Um, because there's actually a large number of people who live more than 100. <laughs> uh, Jean and Calment, I think, there, 122 on the left. Uh, the uh, person in the middle, 119 is that. Yeah. And the guy at the right-hand side is 118, 
116, can't quite read from here, but there's folk, and that's just a number of folk, right, who live way past 100 and some up to 120 odd, right? So we've got a problem, haven't we? If the Bible genuinely says you've got three score years and 10 and that's what God gave you, and it does say in the same verse we'll get to later, some, some might get as far as four score. If that's what the Bible says, well, the Bible's not accurate which is fine. A lot of people say, well, the Bible's not accurate. It's just human writings, old Jewish prophets smoking mushrooms in a cave somewhere. The Bible is not, not inerrant. It's not inspired. It's not God-breathed. So when it says three score a year and ten, it's just nonsense. But the Bible's full of nonsense. And that's not what you and I would probably take away, right? Some might say, well, maybe the time it was written, that particular psalm, we'll get there soon, Perhaps it was three score a year and ten, and it's just, a, you know, the passage of time. But has God's word become less accurate with the passage of time? Or is it possible that uh, the passage in question is being taken out of context? That's what I would suggest, and we'll see as we get there. So let's have a look at Psalms chapter 90. So turn to Psalms chapter 90. You better put your $50 bill there or your, your ribbon if you want because we'd be flopping backwards and forwards to Psalm 90. Uh, let's read verses uh, 1 and uh, 2, Psalms 90, starting with verses 1 and 2. And before you read verse 1, there's a heading, which actually is part of the scriptures. It says, A prayer of Moses, the man of God. That should be in your Bible. It's in, in most of the ones I've seen. A prayer of Moses, the man of God, which actually turns out to be uh, a helpful key, because this is a prayer of Moses, the man of God, right? Given at some point during his life, <laughs> he didn't write it after he died, right? So somewhere in Moses' life, a situation may have arisen which prompted Moses to write this particular psalm. And we'll be looking for that, that episode in Moses' life to try and understand what's going on here. Verses 1 and 2, Moses writes, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Right? So the context as we start here is you know, Moses is talking about, about God, how great God is, and that God exists from everlasting to everlasting, before the world began. God was there. And at the end of time, so to speak, God will be there. You are God, right? And he says, you know, you've been our dwelling place. So what you're going to see as we go through the psalm is that time and time again, uh, Moses will be comparing or perhaps contrasting God and his eternal existence to people like you and me or the people of Israel who are, of course, always temporary. Human beings like you and me are temporary. God isn't. God is everlasting. God is eternal. God is age old. But you and I are temporary, transient, right? We pass so quickly. And uh, before we get any further, it's just interesting in passing that the very first verse says, you have been our dwelling place. That's the sort of uh, thought that Moses brings out in a number of different places, as does King David that God is a place where people like you and me can, can dwell. Other translations, rather than the word dwelling place, say place of safety, strangely enough, or place of refuge. Lord, you are our place of safety, our place of refuge, our dwelling place, right? Which is an interesting thought to have and one that you and I could probably benefit from seeing God as our dwelling place our refuge place, our place of safety. If you look at Psalms 91, which is the next psalm along, and we'll read verses 1 and 2 and 9 and 10. We might be looking at Psalm 91 in more detail next week. It is a psalm of protection, therefore of interest perhaps to us in these uh, difficult times. But Psalms 91 verses 1 and 2, and we're just focusing for a moment before we move on on this uh, this idea, this concept that God is a dwelling place where people can dwell for refuge, for safety, for protection. Verse 1 and 2. 
He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him I will trust. So the, the words there are, God is a refuge, a dwelling place. Verses 9 and 10. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. All right, which would be useful. If you can through a pandemic to know that uh, well, no plague shall, no pandemic shall come near your dwelling because, you know, you, you make the Lord, who is my refuge, your dwelling place. Right, so it's a concept that appears a number of places in the Bible. We're not going to develop it so too much. But you and I, you know, clearly don't today dwell in, in the physical place where God dwells, the new Jerusalem up in heaven. Now, one day we probably will. It looks like when Jesus comes back at the parousia that uh, the, the, uh, the angels catch up the saints, take them back with Jesus uh, into heaven, for, for a while, and we may then dwell literally with, with God in the New Jerusalem, in heaven, what Jesus referred to in the King James Version English, at least, as our mansions, right? <clears throat> but even today, you and I can, can dwell with God in spirit, which means you know, to, to, to share fellowship with God. You'd spend time, if you're dwelling with somebody, whether it's a spouse or a child, or an uncle, or whoever it might be. To dwell with somebody means to spend time with them, right? Probably in our case, a physical environment, but we're not doing that with God. But the other part, spending time with God, a sharing fellowship with God, sharing views with God about the world and ourselves and so on. Uh, if, if we dwell with somebody, we would expect to be familiar with them. If we dwell with them, we'd expect to be close to them. So I think you get the impression there that, that you and I should see God as somebody with whom we share fellowship, share life, and we, we walk together, sort of side by side. That's what it is to, to dwell with somebody. Of course, that's our choice, right? You can choose to dwell with God. Uh, I don't think he'd refuse, or we can choose to ignore him, which is pretty much what the world does. Back to Psalms 90. And let's read verses uh, 3 through 6. And again, keep in mind this comparison between the everlasting God who goes on and on and on forever and you and me and mankind generally because we are temporary. You turn man to destruction. I think many translations say to dust. I guess just implying that eventually we return to the stuff we're made of and say, return, O children of men, for a thousand years in your sight, God, are like yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the night. You carry them away like a flood, they are like a sleep. In the morning they are like grass which grows up. In the morning it flourishes and grows up. In the evening it is cut down and withers. All right, so human beings, a bit like, you know, the grass that grows, grow up. Mature, colourful, lovely scents, whatever it might be. A few hours later, the grass is gone. That's a sort of a symbol of what human beings are like. It says there, you turn man to the dust, to destruction. Like, and for God, a thousand years are just, just a blink of the eye. For a thousand years, as a human being, is like, what, a thousand years? Ooh, my word, that's a long, long time. Humanly, it is. But, uh, you know, for, for God, it's no time at all. You and I are temporary. <coughs> <clears throat> just like grass that grows. And frankly, whether you live to be three score years and ten or a hundred and three score years and ten, it's still temporary. <laughs> Compared to God, a thousand years are like a blink of an eye. They're just like that for God. For human beings, it seems so much longer, right? Look at Psalms 103. So staying in Psalms, but number 103. <clears throat> Let's read verses 13 through 16. Same concept about... The temporary, uh, brief nature of you and me, of mankind, by comparison to the great God who lives forever. Verse 13. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him, for he knows our frame. 
he remembers that we are dust, which, of course, is what we're going back to. As for man, verse 15, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes, for the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. All right? That's, that's you and me. All right? We are, you know, time limited. <laughs> we are temporary. You know, we have a journey. It might seem long humanly to us, but it's a temporary journey. We come to the end of it. And clearly the, the lesson in a number of places, even here, is that should have some influence on our thinking. Now, when you're 18 or 20, 25, you probably don't think this way. So all the time in the world, if I do get three score years in 10 or four score years or four score years in 10, that's way off in the far distant future. Obviously, as you go along your journey, you start to be more aware of the passage of time. But what that should do is help us to to think about our time and think about using our time you know, wisely because there is this harvest we're heading towards, right? And you can't wait to get to the harvest to think, oh, I ought to have done something. <laughs> my harvest has arrived and I'm, oh, I haven't really started yet. Oh, my word. If only I could go back to the beginning. Well, yeah, I think we probably that. all say that. I mean, uh, quite often, I guess, we think, mm, you know, what is the old saying? Uh, too soon old, too late, smart. Is that it? Yeah. Too soon old, too late, smart. That's an old, I think an old Jewish proverb, right? So we can't go back, which is why if we're aware of the fact that we are temporary beings so that we have limited time, it might encourage us to choose our priorities a little bit better, right? Uh, now, the question was still to, to answer is, is that time 70 years? Or, or 80 at a push, right? Is there, some people say, God has appointed a time for you to die. Scripture tells us there's an appointed time to die. Some people say that. You've heard it, right? But really? Do we know when? <laughs> no, you won't know until you drop dead. That's a time appointed by God in eternal time past for you to die. Oh, wow, right? Okay, then that's scary. Well, let's turn to First Peter chapter 1. Don't lose your place in Psalm 90. But First Peter, uh, chapter 1. Because being aware of the passage of time, you know, without getting morbid about it, uh, you know, time, there's only so much. You know, we have 24 hours in a day, all of us. Some people pack a lot into their 24 hours a day, and some of us... <laughs> okay, then, uh, that's 24 hours isn't coming back again, uh, right? Uh, but if, if we're at least conscious of the passage of time that we're temporary individuals, we might be better equipped to make you know, better use of that time so that when the harvest arrives, we are prepared, ready, fruitful and mature and not just thinking about getting started when it's all over. So First Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 22, all the way through to chapter 2 and verse 3. <clears throat> Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, or possibly begotten again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible. So he's comparing that we're not begotten of human physical seed, but of an incorruptible spiritual seed, which is the word of God, which lives and abides forever. So we're going to see the contrast again between the corruptible the carnal, and the word of God, which goes on and on and on and on. The word of God, which lives and abides forever and is the spirit seed that has begotten us to, to eternal life. Verse 24, because, uh, same story, all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man, no matter what it might be, as the flower of the grass, the grass withers. And its flower falls away. And that's what happens to all human beings, kings and queens and emperors. Verse 25, but the word of the Lord endures forever. God is eternal. Mankind, even mankind in his glory, is temporary. <laughs> Carrying on. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Therefore, chapter 2, verse 1, laying aside all malice, all deceit, 
hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. So what he says is, you know, flesh is temporary, like the grass, the flower of the field. The word of God is spirit. And he says here, verse 2, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word of God that you may grow thereby. So that tells us, amongst other places, that the word of God helps us to grow. We should desire it. We should long for the pure milk, the nourishing milk of the word of God that helps us, as if we were little babies, to grow and mature and develop, right? And the word which helps us to grow and develop as an enduring word, as the living word, right? So the contrast, the contrast there between the physical, the temporary, the transient, and the eternal word of God uh, is worth thinking about, right? And, and you and I, you know, should rec recollect and reflect on the fact that we are temporary, right? So we should make some attempt to have decent priorities in our lives, right? Not always putting off the development and the production of fruit until sometime down the road and round the corner, right? As we've said before, now is our day of salvation, right? We don't get another chance. There are many billions who have not yet had the opportunity to find out God's ways, but you have, I have, right? And so we have to use our time wisely, no matter how long that time might be. I mean, Methuselah uh, lived to be 969, which is a very long time, almost 1,000 years. That's a long, long time. But he still died, right? And, and as far as God's concerned, a 1,000 years are like a blink of the eye, right? Let's turn to Ecclesiastes uh, 9 and verse 10, because obviously knowing that our time is limited, now, whether it's three score years and ten, we haven't answered yet. I mean, it's not, but we'll look at it more closely. But if you turn to uh, Ecclesiastes, so that's Psalms, then Proverbs, then Ecclesiastes. That's the order they come in, chapter 9. And verse 10. <clears throat> so we're talking about the fact that you and I have got limited time in which we want to become fruitful and mature. So this tells us a uh, principle. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. Why? For there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. So if Solomon is making a point here that whilst you're alive and kicking, <laughs> get on with it, right? Whatever it is you want to do, whether it's learning to play the violin or the bagpipes or build a replica of the Titanic out of matchsticks, Right? Or, or, or learn to sing or make dresses or knit socks for soldiers or do good for people in your neighborhood. Whatever it is, right? Do it with all your might here and now. Because he says, when you're in the grave, you ain't doing nothing. Right? So, and that's, well, we know that's obvious, right? But it's, it's well stated. Here's the time. This is the time. This is our day of salvation. Our time is limited. Let's make the most of it. That's sort of what he's implying. If you turn to Ephesians chapter 5, so off to the New Testament, Galatians, then Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> We're going to read verses 15 through 17. Yep. Ephesians 5, verse 15. Uh, See then that you walk circumspectly or, or carefully, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So Paul, writing to the believers like you and me in Ephesus, says, uh, walk circumspectly, you know, carefully, be alert, be vigilant, um, not as fools, which is like the world around us, but people who are wise, people who understand Ecclesiastes 9.10, for example, redeeming the time. I think some translations rescuing the time because the days are evil. So don't be unwise, but 
understand God's teachings, right? That's the sort of lesson there. So we're told to redeem the time, right? Uh, one translation, the voice translation, a bit of a paraphrase says, make the most of every living and breathing moment because these are evil times. A lot of translations say make the most of every opportunity because the times are evil. The times are evil, we know that, right? There's a ton of rubbish out there all around us. The world's going to hell in a handbasket by the looks of it. We haven't got a decent leader almost anywhere in the world that you have any confidence in, <laughs> putting out your trust in princes <laughs> or politicians for absolutely sure. Uh, they're basically a shower, aren't they? So the days are evil. And so therefore it says there, redeem uh, the time or redeem the season, I think. Some translations say redeem the time. We have a window of opportunity, right? Redeem it, rescue it, put it to good use. Don't, don't, don't waste it. Don't, don't throw the time away. We've only got 24 hours in a day. We have 168 hours in a week. Once it's gone, it's gone. Now that doesn't mean, of course, that we're going nonstop. Hell for leather every hour of the day, no no leisure, no no rel relaxation, right? No time sitting in the garden watching the birds fly by. Obviously, it's, you've got to balance your life, but you don't want to balance your life to the point where you do diddly squat, and the the the, the weeks stretch into months, which stretch stretch into years, and we've done nothing, accomplished nothing. The harvest is now much much nearer than when, when we first believed. And we have got no fruit, nothing to show for it. So redeem the time, says the, says the apostle there. I came across a couple of figures. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, there are different figures depending on which poll you look at. You know what the people in the USA are like. <laughs> you guys in the US of A love doing polls and surveys. Um, we don't do as much in, in our country, although I imagine the Findings would probably be sort of somewhat similar, but uh, a, a poll or two in the U.S. shows that the average person, whoever that is, in the U.S. spends four or five hours a day watching TV. Five hours and four minutes. Right. One survey says five hours and four minutes, but other surveys that varies a bit, and, 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 it's, and it's changing a bit because huh? you know people aren't always watching a TV. You know, CNN or MSNBC or Tucker Carlson, whatever. People are often now watching the tablets. YouTube videos or, or they're watching on the smartphones, so it's not always easy to get. But it's essentially something like four or five or more hours per day watching Rubbish. stuff. Rubbish. Right? <laughs> Giving up with the Kardashians, people like that. Um, then you compare that to, say, churchgoers and their Bible reading. Now, we're not talking about the average American. We're talking about the average American churchgoer. There aren't many churchgoers in Britain, so there's no point looking for a survey of them. But in America, you do get quite a number of churchgoers. The average is at less than one in five. I think the last survey I saw was about one in seven churchgoers reads the Bible daily. Right? They're watching four or five hours of TV-ish, and 80% of them, almost 85% of them, don't read the Bible every day. And those who do read the Bible every day, the average is between five and 30 minutes. So lots of church, no, not lots of church goers. <laughs> you know, most church goers don't read the Bible every day. Those who do, it can be as little as five minutes. So five hours of TV, keeping up with the Kardashians, gun smoke, whatever it might be, and five minutes of Bible reading. Not Bible study, Bible reading, okay? Well, that is, is that a profitable use of one's time? Is that redeeming the time because the days are evil? Yeah, it is. Five minutes of Bible study, uh, Bible reading, okay. My devotional, I'll read two Psalms today and I'll feel better for that. I'll feel more godly because I've read two Psalms today, two short Psalms, right? <laughs> but I'm now going to watch, you know, I'm going to binge watch <laughs> the latest, you know, detective series on TV. <laughs> oh, okay, I mean, you make your own choice. It just doesn't seem necessarily like the best use of one's limited time. Let's go back to uh, Psalms 90. If you put your, your bill there, your $50 bill, and we'll read verses 7 through 12. <clears throat> 
For we have been consumed. This is a Moses, the prayer of Moses, the man of God. And he's praying to God. For we have been consumed by your anger. And by your wrath, we are terrified. Well, that's, maybe that's another key there. Is that, is that how we would think of God? Isn't God merciful and, and, and loving? Didn't God rise up early and send prophet after prophet after prophet, seer after seer after seer to try and bring his people to, to repentance so he could sort of bless them and leave them in the land that he promised them? But Moses says here, we're consumed by your anger, by your wrath. We are terrified. Now this, I think, starts to give the game away. This prayer is at a time when God is angry and wrathful against the people of Moses, right? Verses 8 uh, through 12. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. For all our days have passed away in your wrath. We finish our years like a sigh. <sighs> the days of our lives are 70 years, or King James, three score years and ten. That's where the passage comes from. The days of our years are 70 years. Sorry, the days of our lives are 70 years. And if by reason of strength they are 80, right? Some will get to 80. Yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. So even if you're living 280, your years are all about labor and effort and striving and sorrow and grief. Sounds horrible, doesn't it? <laughs> Verse 11, who knows the power of your anger? For as the fear of you, so is your wrath. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. And that, that certainly parallels what we've just read several times. Redeem the time. Walk circumspectly. Remember you're like the grass that grows up quickly but fades away quickly. So teach us, verse 12, to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. If, if, if we all understood that we have got limited, well, I mean, we do understand it, it's just often at the back of our minds, right? That we've got limited time and therefore, we need to have some idea about making some better choices so that in our limited time, we can grow and be fruitful and, and multiply and be mature and not just see all the time disappear. And we've accomplished nothing, you know, too soon old, too late smart. So that's, that's the lesson there. But here's the part about you know, verse 10. The days of our lives are 70 years, right? Now, this is not a general description of what God is like. God is not normally consumed with anger. <laughs> he can't be angry, of course. He's not normally, to his people, all right, engaged in wrath against them. The people of God are not normally suffering nothing but labor and sorrow, right? Uh, so the question would be, well, prayer of Moses, was there a time in Moses' life when this actually was reality? Was there a time in Moses' life when God was angry with the people, right? when the people were under some sort of curse and, and dying possibly prematurely at 70? The answer is uh, yes, exactly, there was, right? So let's, again, leave your, your, your bill there, but turn to Numbers 14, and we can see the details, which I think we're quite familiar with anyway. We tend to go through this uh, passage a lot, round about uh, Passover time every year. So we're in uh, Numbers chapter 14, going to read verses 1 through 10. So what had happened in the preceding chapter is uh, the Israelites had reached the, the, the border of the promised land. They sent off 12 spies to have a look around and come back with a report. Two spies came back with a good report. The other 10 spies came back with an evil report, a bad report, which unfortunately the people heeded. Verse 1, So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness. <laughs> foolish, I mean, beyond belief, this is foolish talk. I mean, God's listening. Why has the Lord brought us out to this land to fall by the sword 
that our wives and children should become victims. So they're blaming God. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, let us select a leader and return to Egypt. We're going to throw Moses under the bus and find a, um, a better leader. <laughs> then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly. Uh, but Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, the two good spies, tore their clothes and they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, the land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. It's amazing. It's astonishing. Look at some of the fruit. Look at grapes and pomegranates, right? If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And all the congregation said, Amen, brother. Right on, let's go. Right? Well, if only. All the congregation said, Stone them with stones. <laughs> right? That's not, that's not good. So that, that was, that's rebellion. And this is the, the final rebellion that God's willing to, to put up with. Let's read verses... Um, 20 to 35, the Lord said to, to Moses, I have pardoned the people according to your word, but truly, as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, because all these men who have seen my glory and the signs, miracles, which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, you know, water out of the rock, you know, manna, quail, etc., and have put me to the test now these ten times. And have not heeded my voice. So we've been through this in detail at, at Passover time. On ten occasions, they provoked God. And, and God was very patient. He could have you know, reacted after the first time they rebelled, or the second, or the third, or the fifth. But he was very patient. But of course, it's getting worse and worse. And here they are at the border of the promised land. It's quite evident that they can't go over. They have got no faith in God. He can't, he can't do it. So he's had enough. Um, verse 23, they certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I'll bring him into the land where he went, along with Joshua, of course. Um, now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valley. Tomorrow, turn and move out into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea, that's not towards the promised land any longer. Turn back, you go in the opposite direction. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. Say to them, As I live, says the Lord, just as you've spoken in my hearing, be careful what you say, so I will do to you. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who are numbered, according to your entire number, from 20 years old and above, they're all going to die. If you're 20 or more, you will die in the wilderness. Guaranteed. That's a terrible curse. Except for Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you dwell in. But your little ones, you know, the youngsters, the teenagers, the children, whom you said would be victims, I'll bring them in, and they shall know the land which you have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, your bodies shall fall in this wilderness. Your sons shall be shepherds in the wilderness 40 years. That's not a great life either in many ways, is it? I mean, you're not dying if you're a sub-20 year old, but you're spending the best part of your days in the wilderness looking after sheep for company. It's not great. You're not dead, but it's not a great life, is it? Uh, and bear the brunt of your infidelity until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land, 40 days, for each day you shall bear your guilt one year, namely 40 years, and you shall know my rejection You've rejected me, I'm rejecting you. 
I, the Lord, have spoken this. I will surely do so to all this evil congregation who are gathered together against me in this wilderness. They shall be consumed and there they shall die. Now, that's that's a terrible curse on people who could have gone into a land of abundance and prosperity with beaches, with water, with lakes, with rivers, with waterfalls, with orchards and vineyards. They're going to spend 40 years in the wilderness, all right? And if you're above 20, you'll be died. You'll, you'll die there. So if you're 20 at the time that this curse is given, you'll die at the latest, the age of 60. You know, 20, now 40 years, 60, max. You might well die before that. If you're 30 years old at the time when this curse is given, maximum 40 more years, that brings you to 70, right? And you might well die before that. Probably in many cases they did die before that. If you're 50 at this time, then you've got potentially 40 more years, bring you to 90, right? But the way it's phrased in Psalms 90, it sounds like most folk are going to die by 70. Some stragglers might get to 80, right? But uh, most folk are going to die by 70, right? Some might get to 80. If you're below 20, you're fine. If you're 18 here, right? Well, I'll say you're fine. You'll enter the promised land when you're 58 <laughs> after 40 years of scrubbing around the desert with sheep for company, right? It's not, it's not great, right? That's a curse, but that's not God's standard way of dealing with people, is it? <laughs> he doesn't normally curse people like that. That's not a passage you can take, you know, as a, as a general statement. Three score years and ten is a specific outcome for a specific group of people at a specific time when they were rebelling against God, right? The, um, the Amplified Bible has a footnote to Psalms 90. So the, the, the Amplified it has a psalm, of course, and you read through it in the Amplified Translation. At the footnote at the bottom, it says, Moses says most of them are dying at 70 years of age. This number has often been mistaken as a set span of life for all mankind. It was not intended to refer to anyone except those Israelites under the curse during that particular 40 years. To make it very plain, the translators, this is a specific group of people under a specific curse. 40 years, right? 70 years and they carry on. 70 years never has been the average span for humanity. That's true. When Jacob, the father of the 12 tribes, had reached 130 years of age, he was introduced to the Pharaoh in Egypt, he complained he had not attained to the years of his immediate ancestors. So Jacob's 130 says, well, not done too well, really. You know, my ancestors were much more long-lived than me. And of course, Abraham, uh, I guess his grandfather, Abraham was 175. So this idea that 70 years doesn't stack up with, with history. Um, in fact, Moses lived to be 120. They were, oh, yeah, but Moses was a special man of God. And Moses was on top of the mountain and was in God's presence. That's why Moses lived to be 120. Well, his brother, uh, Aaron, was 123. <laughs> and Miriam, his older sister, was even older, right? And Joshua was 110, right? Um, Note as well, says the footnote, in the millennium, a person dying at 100 will still be thought of as a child, according to Isaiah 65. So this idea of 70 is, is not, it's not biblical, right? It's not what you see in practice. Uh, we saw the chart earlier, you know, 35 nations on the earth today have got people who live over 80 on average, right? And many live much longer than that. Many live to be centenarians, or even older, right? Um, and if we had better, healthier lifestyles, we might live older than 80 and 81 and 82 and 84 and 85, right? Some studies are showing, unfortunately, at the moment that longevity is falling backwards. That's because of the COVID. <clears throat> right? Uh, <laughs> number of reasons for that. Uh, one, of course, is junk food. <laughs> you know, the food that pe people ate, you know, 40, 50, 60 years ago, it wasn't McDonald's and greasy burgers and all the stuff like that. So, you know, foods are very different now than they were a few decades ago. Uh, an awful lot of um, uh, hormones and uh, preservatives and uh, additives and who knows what not in the food that we eat. People live very sedentary lives nowadays. 
there are drugs everywhere. Like I said earlier, you know, the USA is the most medicated uh, country in the world. And, and, and uh, the fact they're not in the top 50 of longevity shows you that you can't equate medicine <laughs> with longevity. Obviously, the two don't go together. Plus, we're living in a you know, polluted world. The water's polluted. The air's polluted. Who knows what not? So apparently, in a number of countries, uh, people's longevity is actually reducing over time. I think the US might be in that category. I can't remember offhand. Okay, let's go back to, to, to Psalms 90. <clears throat> let's uh, read, I guess, the rest of the Psalms. So verses 13 through 17. Return, O Lord. So I guess Moses here is crying out almost for, for God to intervene one more time. He wouldn't. <laughs> Return, O Lord, how long? Have compassion on your servants. O, oh, satisfy us early with your mercy that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days in which you have afflicted us, the years in which we have seen evil. Now, it might be that the younger ones got to enjoy a number of benefits when they went into the land, but that's after 40 years of scrubbing around in the wilderness. Um, Let your work, verse 16, appear to your servants and your glory to their children. Let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. So I guess somewhat plaintively, you know, Moses is crying out for God's mercy and forgiveness and to prosper his people, right? Which is, is fine. But what we can, I think, take away from this is that the three score years and ten is not a target to aim for. It's not some sort of limit put by God upon mankind. Uh, I think in our societies, modern societies, it's, you know, it's, it's sort of at the age of 70, three score years and 10, you can probably see the end coming into sight, right? Uh, but God hasn't set any particular limit upon us, right? And wherever we are in our time period, wherever we are in, in that spectrum from being called to maturity, we should take time and redeem the time and use our opportunities, right? Now, occasionally you will hear people in this sort of theme talking about, yeah, but God has appointed a time for man to die. And your time might be soon, right? <laughs> Is that true? Well, not really, no. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 9. There's, a, again, another passage that is taken usually out of context, at the very least misapplied for sure. So it's Hebrews chapter 9. We're going to read verses 27 and 28. <clears throat> and of course, the time that God's appointed might be when you're 30 or 45, right? Not even 70. That might be a general time, three score years and 10, but God could have appointed an early time for you. So pay attention. Uh, verse 27. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment, so Christ was offered once, to bear the sins of many, to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. But it's verse 27 people tend to misapply. It doesn't say there is an appointed time for man to die. It says it's appointed for man or woman to die once, which is true. Unless you're the, the group at the end of the age, when Jesus sends out his angels, his reapers, to gather in uh, the wheat to his barn, unless you're one of those living at that time who will be changed in the twinkling of an eye, then all of us will die once. It's appointed to us to die once. And then the judgment, right? But there's no appointed time. It doesn't say that, right? Uh, there's no predetermined date. It's not that when your number's up, <laughs> your number's up. And actually, Scripture shows us, we'll run through a few Scriptures now, that the length of our lives, we, we can influence that. There's no specific appointed time. That's not what that says there at all. And how long we do have is rather up to us in many ways, right? Obviously, it helps if you've chosen parents with good genetics, right? But most of us can't do much about that. We are where we are, so to speak. I mean, uh, the, the Queen's 106 her mother was 102. Yeah. The Queen's 96. Uh, her, her mother was 102, which is nearly 103. And uh, other members of her family have been quite, quite long-lived. I mean, her husband was 99. 
right? Mm. So I think her family looks like it's got some decent genetics. Uh, others not. And the more than water. <laughs> not quite so good. But have a look at Proverbs 3. Mm. So look at several places in Proverbs. I think, I think actually most of the next. Yeah, I think we're in Proverbs now until the end. So Proverbs, Psalms, then Proverbs, reading chapter 3, <clears throat> verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> my son or daughter, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. And we read this as, uh, you know, perhaps David giving his advice to, to Solomon, and then Solomon writes it, you know, later. So this is... David saying, my son Solomon, don't forget my law. But I think we typically take it as being this is God the Father giving us as his sons and daughters his guidance and his instructions, right? So we can take it that way. My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands for length of days and long life and peace. They will add to you. Long life in the Hebrew is years of life, right? So verse 2 says, if you obey God and you know, follow after his instructions and guidance, length of days and a long life, a life of years and peace will be added to you. So you can hardly have a specific appointed time for you to die if by obeying God you can add a long life. You can add years of life and length of days, right? Because it would be fixed. If it was appointed time, it, that, that's it. You know, when you're 61 and 102 days, phew, your time's up. When you're 84 and 19 days, phew, your time's up. No, if, if you obey God's law and keep his commands, you can add years of life or presumably the converse. If you don't obey, you won't have years of life added to you. Look at verses um, 13 and 18, same chapter. Proverbs 3, verses 13 through 18. Happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. For her proceeds, wisdom's proceeds, are better than the profits of silver and her gain than fine gold. Most of us would prefer the gold, of course. But wisdom, according to God's view, wisdom is more important. Wisdom is more valuable. Verse 15, she is more precious than rubies and all things you may desire cannot compare with wisdom. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. Verse 16, length of days is in her right hand, in her left hand riches and honour. Her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her and happy are all who retain her. So wisdom, it says in her right hand, are length of days. In her left hand, riches and honour. On the right hand generally is considered the more important. So length of days is in the right hand, so to speak, of wisdom. Length of days. Now clearly, if you don't have wisdom, if you ignore all of the advice, then you may not have length of days. But that would be your choice. You know, do you do you acquire wisdom? Do you go after wisdom? In which case, it may well add length to your days, or do you not? Now look at Proverbs chapter 4, verses 5 through 10. <clears throat> Get wisdom! Exclamation mark. Get understanding. Do not forget, nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her, that's wisdom, and she will preserve you, love her, and she will keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. So you've got the point, right? Uh, in, in God's word, it tells us that wisdom is super important. Uh, and in all you're getting, get understanding. Exalt her, and she will promote you. She will bring you honor when you embrace her. She will place on your head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory she will deliver to you. Hear my son and receive my sayings and the years of your life will be many. If we obtain the wisdom that God encourages us to, to obtain then and we receive the sayings of God 
the years of our life, it says, will be many. So again, that suggests it's not a specific moment in time. The voice translation says, Hear my words, my son, and take them in. Let them soak in so that you will live a long, full life. If you hear God's words. Chapter 9 of uh, Proverbs. I'm going to read verses 10 and 11. Chapter 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So we've just been reading there about get wisdom. Wisdom is the principal thing. Get wisdom. Obtain wisdom. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's where you start. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For by me, your days will be multiplied and years of life will be added to you. So that's several times we've read that now. So at least in general terms, someone who heeds God uh, and, uh, and obtains wisdom. Verse 11, your days will be multiplied. Years of life will be added to you. So we can't have a fixed period if we're able to extend our life by years. If we can multiply our days, right? The only way that can make sense is if we can influence uh, our life. Now, that could be in numerous ways, of course. Um, you know, eating like a pig, <laughs> right? Being 150 pounds overweight, um, enjoying big greasy bacon breakfasts, right? Smoking cigarettes, although that, I think earlier there was a photograph up of Jean Calmet, I think it was, uh, the lady who was 122, was she? She smokes every day. <laughs> She'd live longer if she didn't smoke, right? But you know what I mean, uh, we can do things that are common sense. Uh, they can extend our lives somewhat. And of course, we can do things that can reduce our lifespan. You know, being a complete drunkard, smoking endless cigarettes, shooting drugs in the back alley somewhere, <laughs> not eating proper food. These things will probably shorten your life. And, and even um, you know, wickedness can do that. So let's have a look at chapter 10 <clears throat> and verse 27. <clears throat> The fear of the Lord prolongs days, which we just read, but the years of the wicked will be shortened. So we talked about extending days, multiplying days, length of days, but that says the opposite there. If you're wicked, the years of the wicked will be shortened. It'll be reduced. Again, that could be because you're hanging about with you know gangsters and thieves and nasty sorts, right? Or just the, you know, just the way that the system's set up by God. Uh, certain wicked people, their lives will be shortened over what they might otherwise have been. I think in the context of this, you can think of people like, say, Ananias and Sapphira. Right? That's Acts chapter 5. You remember the story. They made up a, a lie about selling certain property and bringing all the money in to lay at Peter's feet. And, uh, and Ananias died on the spot. And a few hours later, when his wife came in and said, yeah, we sold the property for that much. Spot on, Peter. She died. Right, so I guess that's the years of the wicked will be shortened. The years was shortened rather dramatically. If you think of uh, one Corinthians eleven, not turning there, but it, we commented on it several times that, that we're told to discern carefully when we take the Passover, because those who do not discern the Lord's body, it said, are dying prematurely. They are sleeping. They are weak and sickly. Right. So we said at the time, well, that's a bit odd. So here's people who do not take the Passover with the right mind, the right attitude. They don't discern the body of the Lord. And the scripture says they're dying. They're asleep. And it must be that Paul's surprised that people are dying who shouldn't, he wouldn't expect to be dead. Clearly, they're dying prematurely. Their days are being shortened. And that would appear to be church members, right? I imagine Paul's writing to the church in Corinth and saying some of these folk don't discern the Lord's body and... They're dying prematurely, right? <clears throat> Even Solomon, the guy that wrote the book of Proverbs, you know, in, in my opinion, uh, I've spoken of it before, I think, I don't think Solomon even got to the end of his 50s because Solomon was a very wicked man. Uh, the last we hear of him, he's chasing God's prophet to try and kill him, <laughs> right? And he's turned completely against God. Uh, he's in a terrible sort of state, suicidal. I don't think... Solomon reached his 60th birthday. I think he died in his mid to late 50s. Well, 
he was a wicked man ultimately, right? Very foolish. I don't think he'll be in God's kingdom. It's my opinion. I know people don't all agree with that, but uh, I don't think he'll be in God's kingdom. I hope he is, of course, but I don't think he will be because you read the story, the evidence is there. He was a wicked man and the years of the wicked will be shortened. That's happened, I think, to, to, to Solomon. So there we are. There's no scripture anywhere that says that, that you and I have a specific time that God has appointed for us to die. There's nowhere in scripture that says that you and I are limited to three score years and ten or at a push, four score, right? Um, the average person in, in the modern developed world uh, lives over 80, unless in America, <laughs> when it's about 77, 78 possibly, right? Um, but irrespective, that's not really the point. The point, tying up with last week's, is that however much time we've got, right, we have to redeem it, use it, because it's limited, it's temporary, whatever it is. So we, you know, the takeaway is you and I, you and me, need to use our time wisely. We only come this way once. There is a harvest somewhere ahead of us, right? And we want to be ready for that harvest, to be mature, to be fruitful, right? So like I said last week, the clock is ticking. So let's get going, okay? And with that, we'll conclude today's Bible study.